The power of sin is incredibly destructive. Sin is actually more than our mistakes. It is also a power. And a power that wants to take away all the joy and all the assurance that Jesus has to offer. Jesus came as a freedom fighter and he came to proclaim the good news that the kingdom of God had come. And he also came to reclaim image bearers, reclaim them back to their creator so that they could spend eternity with him, but also live the most abundant life now possible. But I don't know about you, but as good as that news is, sometimes it's just life's hard. There's decisions that I want to make, things that I want to do, and I don't make a good decision. There's things that I don't want to do, things that, th things that I need to stay away from, and yet I find myself kind of creeping towards them and end up doing things that I, I don't want to do. I want to be a good person, and yet I fail. Can you relate? Has that ever been you? Was it you and a carload of family members on the way here this morning? I think scripture supports what it is that I'm saying. Romans 7 says this. It says, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Can anybody relate? But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. These are words written by Paul, maybe the greatest missionary the earth has ever known. This is after he's met Jesus. He's a follower of Jesus, and yet he is still speaking of the very real struggle of sin in his life. Can you relate? Because you see, the power of sin is incredibly destructive. It is incredibly deadly. Sin is actually more than our mistakes. It is also a power. And a power that wants to take away all the joy and all the assurance that Jesus has to offer. Scripture drives that home whenever Paul writes this in Romans. It says, for the wages of sin is death. Wages, that's what you get for what it is that you've done. You have a job, you go and do the things you're supposed to do, you get a paycheck. When it comes to life and the poor decisions that we make, the sins that we commit, death are our wages. Jesus' half-brother James says it this way in the first chapter of his book. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Can we go back to celebrating one church? That was so much better news. <laughs> All warm and fuzzy, like the air has just been sucked out of the room. But here's the reality. In order for us to know the beauty and the magnitude of what Jesus is doing for us, we also have to know the seriousness of our current reality. And there were times that as Jesus was talking to his 12 closest followers, his disciples, he had to share hard news with them. But in doing so, he was telling them the truth, but also wanted to be gracious to let them know that there is a turn that's coming. In one of those moments in John 16, 33, Jesus says this, I have told you, Jesus is speaking, I have told you all this so that you may have peace. In me, Not so that you'll feel guilty, not that you'll have shame, but that you'll have peace in Jesus. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. There's the truth. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. There's the grace, church. Can we celebrate that? This is Baptism Sunday, y'all. I need the whoopers, the ameners, all of you that are expressive. Let's hear it today. This is the day that you let it rip, okay? But he has overcome the world. He doubles down in 1 John 3, 8 that says this, but the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And we know Satan is like a roaring lion prowling around seeking who it is that he can devour. 
But what we know is that Jesus is more powerful than the devil in sin. You see, when you know the king of kings, you don't have to worry about some fool that's trying to act like the king of the jungle, okay? The Lord of lords and the king of kings is more powerful than anything that Satan has tried to throw at us, anything that sin has tried to throw at us. That is how powerful Jesus is. But there's a flip side to that. We have to know that Jesus is more powerful than the devil, but you ain't, and neither am I. In fact, Scripture says it very clearly and very plainly in Romans 5, 6. It says, when we were utterly helpless, utterly helpless sounds a little bit redundant, but sometimes our thick-headedness needs some redundancy. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. We have to acknowledge that we are powerless and helpless towards sin on our own. We could learn from our brothers and sisters that are walking through recovery and celebrate recovery as they go through the 12 steps. The first step is that they recognize that they're powerless. We could learn that from our brothers and sisters. I can remember that I was studying with a guy who was a Marine. He was kind of in the special forces and He was really struggling with this idea of being utterly helpless and needing somebody to come and rescue because he said, look, that goes against my training. I'm the rescuer. I'm the one that comes in and fights against the bad guys. I'm the one that sets people free. And for you to say that I'm utterly helpless just messes with my mind because I'm conditioned for that to not even enter into how it is that I think. And I said, all right, let me, let me see if I can help and put it into context for you. But he had been in the Middle East. Let's say you've been deployed and You encounter an IED and it explodes and and you take the brunt of that explosion and you find yourself face up on a dirt road and that explosion has blown off your arms and your legs and you're laying there utterly helpless. Are you helpless in that moment? And he's like, well, no legs, no arms. He goes, whoa, 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 do I have my my eyelids? And I'm like, sure, you can have your eyelids. And he goes, okay, then I'm not utterly helpless. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he goes, well, I can communicate. I can communicate via Morse code. And so, and I'm like, okay, no eyelids. You don't get any eyelids either. <laughs> and he's like, okay, then I would be utterly helpless. But not only would he be utterly helpless, but there would have to be somebody else to come and rescue him so that he would not die. If the wages of sin are death, guess what? Dead people can't help themselves. And dead people can't help other dead people. We need somebody who's alive. We need somebody who is not powerless to death. We need somebody by the name of Jesus. You see, if we sing songs like my sin not in part, but the whole has been nailed to the cross, the only way that that's true is Jesus has to be who he says that he is. Do you remember that scene? And he asked the most important question that'll ever be asked, the most important answer that you'll ever give. And he says, who do you say that I am? He's been hanging around with his 12 disciples. They've been doing ministry almost three years and it's kind of time to do a progress report. And he's like, all right, what's the word on the street? Who do people say that I am? Are they getting what it is that we're teaching? Are they getting what it is that we're doing? And the disciples are like, oh, oh, it's going really well. They think you're Elijah or they they think you're Jeremiah or they, 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 you know, they know you're a prophet. Uh, There's there's some people that say you're John the Baptist, which is weird because he baptized you. And so now how y'all are the same. But but anyway, most, most people are saying a prophet. So it's going really well. And I can't help but think that Jesus kind of dropped his, dropped his head at that moment and just kind of started praying and going, Dad, they don't get it. Our target marketing ads aren't working. Our TikTok videos aren't working. Our, our, our search engine optimization, we need to fix, we need to, what do we need to do? And I think the father said, why don't you ask them? Ask the 12. And I think Jesus looked up and he took the time to look each and every single one of them in the eye is he asked this question, something that I wish I could do with each and every one of you. And he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up and Peter says, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, that's right, Peter. And it wasn't flesh and blood that told you that, but it was my father in heaven. 
And it is on this truth that I will build my church. And guess what, Hill's family? He said, and the powers of hell will never conquer it, ever. We have to know who Jesus is in order for his claims to be possible. Remember that illustration? Rick's done it a few times where he talks about grace and and a demonstration of that. And there's these graduate students. They're taking a philosophy of religion course, and they're going in to take their final. This final has a horrible reputation of how hard it is. Nobody's allowed to talk about it. Nobody's able to tell anything about it. These students walk in. They know how much of their grade is dependent upon this final. They sit down. The final is there, face down. The professor stands up, and she says, okay, you can look at your test now. They take it, they flip it over, and they, their name's been filled out. Every question has been filled out. They, they've all already been graded. They've gotten every single one right. They've gotten 100% on this final. And the professor says, that is, in fact, going to be your grade. And you have not earned it. It has been given to you freely. You have just experienced grace. That's pretty incredible. Right? But the authority and power of that professor is limited. Because if one of those students walked into Physics 101 next week, taking their final, and turned it over, and it's empty, and they've got to fill it out, and they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. My other professor filled everything out, and I got 100. And he's like, well, that's fine. She can do that. But that's not what happens here. You're not getting any gifts here. Because that religion professor's authority was limited. If Nola and I, Nola's my wife, say we were out and we went to, a, went to a dinner and a movie and we stopped by Quick Trip on the way home and, and, and somebody came in and started to, to rob the place and I'm kind of getting closer to, to protect her and it goes south and bullets start flying and, and all of a sudden as I'm protecting her, I take a, a, a bullet that's fatal to me but misses her, it would have killed her. And so from that moment that I die until the moment that Nola takes her last breath, That's the amount of grace that I can offer her, but not anymore because my authority, my power is limited. If we're talking about every single one of our sins being removed as far as the east is from the west and that we get to spend eternity with God forever, then the person who's doing that better have all the authority that there is to have for that to be possible. And luckily, Jesus said at the Great Commission, all authority on heaven and earth have been given to me. And he proved it. In Romans 1, 4, it says, and he was shown, talking about Jesus, to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yes. And if Jesus has done that for us, what does it mean for us? How is it that we get to participate in that? Scripture answers that in John 1, 12, and it says this. It says, but to all who believed him, talking about Jesus, and accepted him, talking about Jesus, he, Jesus, gave the right to become children of God. Everybody who believed in him and accepted him, then he gave the right to become children of God, that we would believe he's the Son of God. That he died on the cross, paid for all of our sins, he was buried, he defeated death, and he rose again. And in doing that, he demonstrated that you are helpless, but he is not. And if you will admit that, that you are a sinner and you need a Savior, and it's only Jesus, then he will give you the right to become something, someone new, to become a daughter or a son of the one true King. You see, we are no longer slaves when we believe and receive Jesus. We are freed from the penalty and the reality of sin. We are no longer slaves. In fact, we live in such a way as it says in Romans 8, 2. It says, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Jesus didn't just step out of a tomb on the third day. Jesus rose from the dead and he put death to death. And that same spirit that uh, raised him from the dead is available to you 
and to do the same in your life as well.